Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to this session. Uh, my name is Victoria Gomez, and I'm the Big Data Sales Leader for Europe for IBM, and I'm here today with Frank. Frank, I'm uh, uh, working a lot with open source solutions, have been working on data science and uh, AI for the past five years. Okay, so, uh, well, there's no doubt that open source is, uh, will continue to drive innovation and speed in, in, in AI. Actually, well, this is a quotation from uh, Kaggle that says that 87% of the AI developers depend on open source technologies. And I like to make people, you know, uh, work a little bit during my uh, talks. So raise the, your hand those that know the IBM commitment to open source. Don't be shy. Okay, yeah, I was expecting something like this. That happens many times, but even though, I'm going to show you something new then. I'm happy about that. Uh, let's see first this quick, quickly this video, if I can play it. Okay, why is it here? Yeah. I think you should see this. It's just a kid. This is a G chord. He's learning, absorbing. He's getting smarter every day. Homo habilis was the first to use tools. A player who makes the team great is more valuable than a great player. Losing yourself in the group for the good of the group, that's teamwork. It's happening fast. We've always watched the stars. If you look at the sky, you can see the beginning of time. Collecting data is only the first step toward wisdom, but sharing data is the first step toward community. Poetry. There's not much glory in poetry, only achievement. Knowledge, amplification. What he learns, we all learn. What he knows, we all benefit from. One little thing can solve an incredibly complex problem. Everything's about timing, kid. This is business. Faster, better, cheaper. Constant improvement. So, you want to fly, huh? Wind speed, thrust. It's physics. Res publica non domine tu. Plummet. It's all about the tools. Speak your mind. Don't back down. Does he have a name? His name is Linux. So we were already saying this is uh, back from uh, 2003, an IBM commercial. Uh, the quality is not that good. That's why we played it small. But uh, so this represents you now uh, that this is not new for, for us, for IBM. We have been here in this space and we are fully committed and uh, contributing to open source. Th this is an analogy, as you could see, of how we're all, let's say, uh, sharing information, uh, making the, um, with this open community, uh, contributing to advancing, right, the technology showing, uh, in this case, uh, teaching to this small boy. So, oh, okay, here. So, as I was saying, this is not new to IBM. We started, uh, maybe you don't know, but we were co-founders of the Apache Software Foundation already back in 1999. And here are some highlights, some uh, uh, of the open source uh, projects where we're co contributing, committing to. Uh, there are a lot more, but we just pick and choose a few of them. Yeah, so if you look at the, uh, at the history, uh, Linux was definitely a huge investment from IBM. It was a um, billion dollars that we spent on the, the growth of Linux and making sure that Linux was successful in the, uh, in the enterprise. And that's what you see it has paid off today, because if you look at a lot of enterprises today, they are running Linux. Um, we are doing the same when it looks like, I mean, of course, there's many, many open source projects out there, and we're trying to contribute to the ones that are most relevant. Uh, Spark is a good example of that as well, and I'll talk to, about that in the next slide too, but uh, Spark has really changed the way of, as a successor to the Hadoop MapReduce, uh, as becoming you know, the, op the, the framework for scalable analytics and scalable processing of large volumes of data. But at the same time, we are looking at um, things that are relevant for companies like governance. Uh, governance meaning that you have to understand where the data is coming from, where the data is flowing to, who has access to the data, where you have uh, data needs to be masked, etc. And this is one of our main initiatives that you see at the bottom with Apache Ageria, um, working together with Hortonworks and some 
uh, banks also on Apache Atlas. Um, so really that's what is driving us, making sure that uh, open source is used and open source is su uh, successful in enterprises. And well, obviously, we cannot uh, miss to mention, right, the uh, partnership with uh, Hortoworks, now with Cloudera, and uh, well, with others like, uh, for instance, MongoDB. So, um, Codate is, is the new name. Um, it's a open source technology center. It used to be called the Spark Technology Center, and I consider that like state and church. So, the Spark Technology Center, or Codate, is a center that is funded by IBM, but is not on the IBM payroll. So they are the church, they do whatever they like, they do what is good for the open source, what is good for their religion, uh, and at the same time we have the state that kind of pays that, that funds them. So when you look at Codate, if you go to their website, it is um, bringing together like a model repository, much like GitHub is for, for uh, uh, open source solutions. It is working on, for example, uh, expanding Jupyter into, or expanding processing into uh, large-scale um, uh, data stores, etc. cetera. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of foundational work that is being done for making sure that data science becomes more successful, and we are also contributing to data science projects like uh, SystemML to make sure that you can do scalable uh, analytics on very large volumes of data. Yeah, you mentioned Keras, right? Keras, you mentioned? Uh, Keras is, ah. is one of them as well, but yeah. Yeah, yeah Keras, TensorFlow, so yeah. So one of the things that we often see is that, um, you know, data science, if you look at the open source, it has really become the foundation for successful data science. There's a lot of work being done, a lot of innovation being done for data science now in open source, and that has traditionally been the case with R and with the Python libraries, etc. But when data scientists work with open source solutions, they may not always be the, the solutions or the open source projects that will um, live in the end, that will live in two or three years from now. What, what we are contributing to is to also govern the open source solutions and making sure that companies can actually use them and depend on them going forward. So um, not use an open source solution that will not be there in two years from now because there's no more funding or because there's no more contributions to them. So we are investing in uh, high quality open source projects like Jupyter, like uh, you know, collaborating with RStudio, uh, um, investing in Python, and then bringing that to um, our own solutions, but also to our private and public clouds to make sure that customers who invest in that or companies who invest in that can continue to use them going forward and not be dependent on a few you know, very active and very passionate people uh, delivering those projects. I would also add to that that uh, because of our commitment our, and our um, contribution to open source, we are actually um, leveraging all these technologies as part of our, uh, let's say, offering solutions. Yep. I mean, it is really key into our DNA. Okay, so. Oh, the sound doesn't not, work. Yeah. Take Jack, for example. Jack loves waffles. Well, How me, do you know? Let me go back. Customer data, you got it, tons of it, and you know your customer. Take Jack, for example. Jack loves waffles. How do you know? Because Sunday Jack said so on social. And last Friday, he'd been searching for a waffle maker in your online store. Boom! Now you're ready to talk to him. Because you know Jack. Except, Jack was actually just carving up for a 5K at the end of the week. He's not so much a waffle freak as a fitness freak, but you already assigned him to a target audience, so you're still talking to him about all things waffle. Jack deletes the email without opening it, and then he ignores your SMS, and closes your ad. So you don't know Jack. And to give Jack an experience that would have actually been right for him, you should have had an AI-powered platform that connects all your data to show that he's not obsessed with brunch, he's obsessed with running. You also would have known that Jack is actually Jacqueline. If your marketing can't make sense of your data, you don't know Jack. So this is a Ooh. customer. Okay, sorry. Didn't want to play twice to wake you up. Uh, so uh, th this is an IBM commercial, and even though this is for uh, an IBM product, we, w what we wanted to use it here for is to highlight that it is very important, or we really believe in the open source in this space, in AI, and uh, we have, let's say, tools and things that 
can make that happen. However, uh, in order to be able to get to extract uh, good value and good out outcomes of uh, our data, like in this example, you need to do more things, right? And here's what we call the ladder, the ladder to AI. So how we operationalize, right, AI across the enterprises. So, uh, well, this is a prescriptive approach that we use with our customers to help them um, in that journey, uh, um, linking data and going up to, to AI. We also use it, or it can help customers to identify in which steps they are uh, currently in that letter. We say that there is no AI without IA, meaning that you need a sound um, uh, informational architecture in order to achieve or get to the, to the AI at the top of the ladder. So the ladder has different uh, steps. At the bottom, we have the collect, um, collect um, la uh, step, which is in order to get all the information that you need from, uh, from your company. We are seeing many customers uh, when we work um, across Europe, both Frank and I, that they have the data in silos and they don't have this data connected, right? So that's the first challenge, how to get the first step, they collect, um, collect the data to, to establish a strong foundation of the data. Next step is the organize. So how you really get trusted data so once he's collecting it, but then you need to make sure that it's well governed and trusted. Second is the analyze. So how you uh, apply, start applying machine learning models to extract data, the value out of, uh, sorry, the value out of the data. And last is uh, infuse AI. By infusing, we mean uh, go, um, managing the full cycle of AI and making sure that um, it is um, trusted a AI processes, well, models that are in place, also deployment of them. And obviously, when we talk of modernize, we're talking also of leveraging multi-cloud. So having customers that can have multiple options of uh, clouds uh, to run on. Okay, so. Um, can, can you anything? go back to the yeah. previous slide? So the, the most important here is that you know there's a lot of co companies embarking on uh, machine learning, using data, using data science, using machine learning models in general in their business, and trying to create value out of the, all the data that they already have. But when you build those models, when data scientists build the models, can you actually trust which data they have used? Have they used public data? Is the data that they have used are they entitled to that? Is there any? Uh, sort of bias in that data, so it is, is it uh, sex or gender specific, etc. And that is what we're trying to do here is to, when you infuse AI into your business processes, is that you also can trust where the data came from and how it has been transformed along the way. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Okay, so we start at the bottom of the ladder with the collect um, piece. I'm going to go through the ladder explaining you also some uh, customer references that, and what they've been doing across the, uh, the ladder to the AI. Okay. So this is NetBank. NetBank is one of the four largest banks in South Africa. And they have a lot of uh, different businesses from corporate banking, investment banking, retail. And they have a lot of data that it's, uh, th they need to work on. They need to first identify it across their uh, organization and their these different uh, businesses. Um, so they evolve the data architecture, driving uh, what we know what we call the data virtualization. So in order to to get this this data from all these different places, instead of using the typical ETL tools or uh, uh, uploading the data, they were using data virtualization in order to be able. To, to query that, well, to have access to that uh, information from a, a, in a different way, right? Not moving the data. The next step is organize. So once uh, that you have gathered, you have access to that data, you need to make sure that it's trusted and it has good quality. In this example, we use, uh, uh, this is New Year Secrets. So um, prior to January 2017, uh, they had to, uh, if you were arrested, if you did something uh, that was illegal, uh, they, would, you, they would arrest you and they would put you a bail. If you were not able to pay that bail, then you would be sitting in jail for 30 days until a card 
would be able uh, to uh, review your case and then decide what would be the, the, the penalty, right? Um, so they removed that process and they changed it and uh, now they have to be reviewed in 48 hours. The challenge they have is that uh, there are, um, uh, well, there were two, 200 million uh, cases and 40 million parties in the system. So in order to manage that, it was taking them hours in order to identify right, the, the right pieces of information. And it was a process that was executed manually. So they implemented this uh, um, solution that it's helping them to reduce that process from two to three hours to three seconds. If you multiply that by the number of uh, employees that would have been required in order to meet the 48 hours uh, time frame that they have now to resolve and uh, define what is the, the bail, uh, in total they are having savings like something around eight to 10 million uh, per year in order to solve uh, from 50 to 80,000 cases that they process per year. There's also a conclusion New Jersey is apparently very criminal. <laughs> okay, and uh, next step is, well, analyze. As we were saying, uh, uh, deploying these machine learnings, uh, uh, machine learning models, in order to do predictive uh, um, use cases, right? So in this case, we're going back to NetBank. And uh, NetBank is using uh, machine learning algorithms, the leveraging Python, to predict um, outages of the, the ATMs. So they have more than 40,000 ATMs across the country. And um, until that moment, they were only uh, detecting when there was a failure, an outage, when the outage had already happened, right? And it, they were actually fixing the problem the following day, so uh, you can imagine uh, that what um, inconvenience that was creating for their users, right? So um, they implemented this new process, a machine learning model that is helping them predict the outages and also the cash needs in order to provide a better service to their customers. Yeah, the other thing that they're doing is, so they're not only applying machine learning to predict when there's an outage or when the ATM is empty, but also they are prescribing which route the people that service those machines have to follow in order to fill up the machines. So the, f the, the machines that are very much in demand where there's a lot of cash withdrawn, they are filled up earlier than the other machines. So it's also an optimization thing that they are implementing. And the last step of the ladder is uh, infuse. And as we were saying earlier, and Frank was also helping me with the description, it's uh, governing the full cycle of AI. And one important thing, as he was mentioning, it's uh, detecting, for instance, the bias. So what we're seeing here is that only one in 20 companies are extensively using AI. And that's actually because they need to have uh, the trust in the model and in order to be also able to explain what has been the, the process when executing that, uh, those um, recommendations right, from AI. So in this space, um, I want to talk to you about AI Furnace 360. This is an open source library that IBM has put into the community uh, that helps detect uh, bias and remove them, right? So if you're interested or you have someone interested also in this uh, space, I know that, that this is a very hot topic right now, all the bias um, around machine learning. Well, this is a, a, an open source um, library that we have put it of, uh, they're free for you to use. So th th there's another aspect to data analytics. Um, so w we used to think that you know um, the data warehouse would solve everything. You would put all the data in the data warehouse and then the solutions or everybody would analyze only from the data warehouse. And what we've seen is that with the, um, the uprise of big data and with the large volumes of, of uh, data that are generated all across the world is that customers do not necessarily put their data in a central place anymore, but it is spread across the cloud. Now, there is something, I mean, there's um, the, the physics of data where you have data gravity. You need to analyze the data as, as close to the, where the data resides. So you want to avoid that you have to move uh, loads and loads of data. 
what we are uh, doing with our strategy is that we are not focusing on only on data warehouse or centralizing all of the data. Is that you? I think so. <laughs> um, centralizing all data, but making sure that you can actually analyze the data where it resides without having to mo move loads, uh, large volumes of data. Partly that is through, um, uh, you know, working with uh, with Hadoop solutions like uh, Cladera and Hortonworks, but also that is partly through data virtualization to be able to access the data where it resides. You good? So it's it's kind of a simple diagram, but when uh, what, what customers or what, what people often forget when uh, when you move data about and when you move certain services to the cloud, etc., there's a data aspect to this, or there can be a data aspect to this. So if you decide to move some of that analytics to the cloud, you also have to think about where do I put my analytics? Do I keep my analytics on-premise or do I move my analytics to the cloud as well, or to a different cloud? Um, data locality is really important and you, you have to think about that. What we are doing as a strategy is to become multi-cloud, and partly that's through our offering, but it's also through a vision that we have of, of uh, exploiting our solutions, is making sure that you can actually, as a company, decide, I want to have multiple cloud providers, I can have some of the workload on any uh, cloud vendor, and I can make sure that the analytics takes place as close to the data as possible. And then, the other thing that we are uh, again implementing the uh, the ladder to AI or the you know creating trusted analytics is that when you work with a data pipeline uh, and the data pipeline is really something that you know in data science and in general in data analytics or business intelligence whatever you want to call it is that there is an aspect of collecting and connecting to the data so collecting the data maybe in a central data warehouse or to a local data store or connecting to it elsewhere making sure that you refine the data so that there's people who actually look at the data, who understand that there is uh, bad quality of the data, filter out the values, impute values. Uh, but when you do that, there is an aspect to this that is called the catalog. Because you can do whatever transformations to the data uh, when possible, but if you misinterpret a certain value, etc., that will in the end have an effect on the analytical models that you create. So what we are doing when the with the implementation of the ladder to AI is we are infusing or creating also a catalog layer that will allow different components, and that is not only IBM components, it's also components from other providers and open source components, to work with the same catalog to make sure that everybody has the same view of the data, understands the quality of the data, the definition of the data, and we're really trying to make sure that when data scientists, typically very high qualified people, um, when they analyze the data, they, they have a good understanding of the data without the constant back and forth to the business. So again, implementing the ladder to AI from collection to infusing into the, uh, into the organization, into the business applications. Okay, so I think we are early. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is uh, more a wrap up. Um, First of all, as we were saying at the beginning, um, open source is driving innovation, is driving speed. So this is, let's say, how we believe this is what we presented to you is our view, let's say, our, uh, like Frank was saying, our strategic approach to uh, operationalizing AI. And so at the core, let's say we have the open source, all open source tools and uh, of any, um, uh, all open source tools from AI, from data too. So we believe in uh, pre-built, pre-integrated, let's say, sorry, capabilities across data to provide governance and integration, and also make the link that to uh, data and, and data science and business and analytics. And third, a true cloud agnostic uh, approach, as Frank was mentioning, uh, the importance of uh, being able to deploy on uh, whether, depending on the data gravity, uh, where it provides value and where, wherever we can get closer to the data in order to achieve better performance. Okay. okay. Yeah. Any questions? Well, and we can help you in yeah. this journey. So uh, we have the teams, we have resources from open source, from anywhere to help you. So, um, yeah, anything else? And we're here at the booth as well, so we have a couple of people yeah. that are specialized in, specialized in this journey. So we're around. If you want to talk to us personally or about your problem, please come to us.
maybe you have some questions now. Any question? Yeah. Hans. Yeah, I have a question. You have to come to the mic. Ah, <laughs> yeah. So I have a question about uh, the bias, eh? and th th that's a really hot topic. Eh? Um, yeah. You explained the example of uh, legal helping uh, helping uh, an, uh, analytics and AI uh, uh, inc speed up uh, legal processing, yeah. but we also see it in HR or maybe in approving landings uh, mm. loans. In all these cases, uh, a model can go really the wrong way. And we mm. have also seen it in the chatbots with uh, with some examples that that really went uh, way off. Yeah. But then how can, if you all automate this pipeline, is, is it in the intention of IBM also, and uh, I am an IBM, but I don't know everything about IBM, uh, is it the intention also that we make our bias detection framework such that automatically we can stop at a certain level of bias we detect, with, which is, un, uh, well, uh, not allowable? So yes, um, there's, so, so the, the anti-bias and also um, against adversarial attacks. Adversarial attacks, um, it is something that we ingrain in our data science pipeline or our analytics pipeline. Um, so definitely it can already be used during the development of the process. What we see now is that basically using the, um, the um, uh, the solution or the, the bias detection is that we generate trust with the people that actually utilize the models. So when eventually you have to represent or present to an authority, this is the method that I've been using, explain explainability of the AI models, making sure that, or proving that the models are not biased. That is basically the, the primary use case that I'm seeing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but my question is, uh, I, I've, I've done my model development and then I deployed it. Uh, so probably some uh, transaction processing engine uses the model to make certain decisions yep. and then it goes wrong then does it have a break? That's my question. Or are we thinking about a break? Maybe we don't have it now, but are we thinking about a break, saying at a certain level of a threshold we can set, now we have to force the model developer to inspect it and maybe roll back the deployment of the model. Yes, yeah. that's because absolutely in some, true. in some cases, yeah. I mean, I, maybe loans, maybe HR, we, we think it's a little yeah. bit innocent, but there are also models, for example, that making decisions in really automatic systems yeah, uh, um, cars is maybe, but we can also think about factories or all sorts of really, uh, well, critical operational processes where AI also will be, and models will also be used. Yeah. So w when you look at the data pipeline and the checking of models, there's definitely the performance of the models is always checked and it is monitored and it is kept in the governance, uh, you know, in the catalog to ensure that you have a history of the performance of the models. You can retrain the model whenever a model bec um, uh, drops it below a certain threshold, etc. But then um, this, this process of checking bias, etc. and checking the quality of the model is definitely something that we are infusing in all the capabilities, for sure. Okay. So it's AI open scale, yeah. right? Yeah. So we have the tools here yeah, that uh, to detect the bias and uh, to track explainability of the models and everything. So we do have uh, tools for okay. that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Welcome. Okay, any other question? No? Complaints? <laughs> maybe we can reinforce Come to our booth message. if you have them. <laughs> We can reinforce maybe some message. We would like to reinforce Go ahead. any of the yeah. message. <laughs> no, we uh, have time, but it's uh, yeah. otherwise we will just I mean, we were, offer you we a coffee. We wanted to <laughs> save some time for question and answers. I believe that uh, we made it faster than we were originally planning to, but uh, you know we thought it was interesting, and we normally like to interact with the audience and also get questions because that's normally when you uh, learn more from others too. Um, no. Then thank you. Okay, thank you so much.